Tell us about living in Chicago and hearing jazz music. You probably saw shows at the Jazz Showcase and other clubs there. Tell us about the Chicago scene. So I was born in Chicago, first generation Filipino, and uh, I didn't get serious about saxophone or jazz until high school when I had a great jazz band director named Tom Beckwith, who has passed since then, and I miss him every day. Uh, but he introduced me to jazz, to the real thing, Cannonball Adderley, Sonny Rollins, Sonny Stitt, Coltrane, Dexter Gordon, Joe Lovano, all these guys. And he's like, you have to check this stuff out. And I fell in love with jazz. And so after getting that, uh, you know, recorded education, I started going to the jazz showcase a lot. I started going to the Hungry Brain a lot. I started going to the Empty Bottle a lot, where Vandermark was playing every week at the time. And so I got a cross section of a lot of different music by a lot of different authentic people playing those musics. And the showcase was great because, you know, the Dave Holland Quintet would come to town. I saw Steve Lacey there. Uh, I met Johnny Griffin there. I got to meet Kenny Garrett there. So just an incredible spot. And, you know, I went to Von Freeman's jam session a lot of weeks. So Chicago was a melting pot for all different kinds and directions of improvised music. And I think I'm super thankful for being a part of that scene because... It's omnidirectional, and everyone was inclusive of everybody, and you could you could join a lot of different scenes and a lot of different uh, styles and genres, um, and you could move in and out of these things and be working all the time if you were, you know, humble and honest and trying to get better at all these different kinds of music. Cool. And I carry that with me to this to this day. Cool. Were you uh, exposed to Brazilian music of some kind back in Chicago at some point in your life? Yeah. I played for about five years in a band called Chicago Samba that was all people from Sao Paulo and myself. And so during the breaks, they would speak in Portuguese to each other at the bar, and I couldn't understand a lick of what they were saying. But uh, on the bandstand, it didn't matter. I came from my j jazz background, and I knew the the Joe Beam tunes and things like that, but they taught me the Kaimi tunes and they taught me the Veloso tunes and, and just to ex ex experience and appreciate more of the Brazilian music history. You know, as a jazz musician, Joe Beam is, is the king of that, but there are so many other great composers and, and band leaders and songwriters there that I'm super thankful for my time with Chicago Samba. Yeah. Okay. Well, today you recorded with Ivo Perelman, and it was definitely not Brazilian music, although the man is Brazilian. Uh, how, how did it go? How was your experience recording today? And do you see any connection between Ivo's uh, uh, structural roots being Brazilian uh, or not? Or how, how was your experience in general today? Man, when Ivo reached out to me to be a part of this duo project, I couldn't jump at it faster. <laughs> it's incredible. I'm, I've been a fan of his and his uh, philosophical musical ideas and his his risk taking for his for his albums um, for a long time. So I'm really glad to get to collaborate with him and the other people that are on this record. I'm really looking forward to their music and their contribution to it because it just seems like a fun group of people. I appreciate Evo's energy so I can understand that lineage from the Brazilian Thing, the energy, the melodicism, but I also appreciate that he's willing to go no parameters and any music from ragtime to no time is uh, acceptable. And so I, I feel a kindred spirit kind of vibe with, with Evo in that regard. Great. Um, how do you feel about playing free jazz? Because you, 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 you are a player of... Uh, multiple uh, skills and genres and you're very versatile. How do you feel about specifically playing free jazz? Yeah, free jazz is a is an integral part of the Chicago scene. And it was, it was an integral part of who I was growing up and uh, my explorations of different kind of music in Chicago. You know, the AACM is such a an important influence to Chicago musicians and, and other like nameless and countless musicians all around the world. 
Um, so I definitely carry some of those philosophies with me. Uh, even if you're thinking straight ahead jazz, like Von Freeman is such an avant-gardist in a way in, in the straight ahead jazz world. And he covers a lot of ground both in and out of, of straight ahead jazz. So I just have a lot of influences that, that love standards and open ended free improvisation. So in my mind, I study and I practice straight ahead jazz and free improvisation and there's no real difference in my mind. I try to just uh, be one with the energy of my fellow players and if it happens to be more of a straight ahead thing one night and more of an open thing a different night, I just try to stay true to myself within that and uh, for me I've found that studying all different styles in all different directions strengthens every single one of those directions. So um, it's just way more fun and interesting for me. Cool. Um, tell us about your core groups, like mostly other people do the killing. Your own quartet, playing with Mary Halverson and Dave Douglas. And maybe you can contrast it with playing with a variety of musicians, like Billy Joel, Lou Reed, Connor Oberst, Winton Marsalis, Christian McBride, and Kenny Barrow. Wow. <laughs> he did a homework. <laughs> yeah, wow, okay. Um, you know, since I moved to New York in 2001, I've been really blessed with the chance to get to play with a lot of my contemporaries and a lot of my heroes and learn from them on and off the bandstand. So um, I joined Dave Douglas's quintet back in 2011 or 12. That's been invaluable to me. Um, to see how he works, see how he goes about his business, see how open he lets that band get with his music. Um, I grew up uh, musically with most of the other people do the killing with Mappa Elliott and Peter Evans, and they taught me a lot about the music. Uh, man, I've been playing with Mary Halverson for forever, and she's just one of the greatest musicians and one of the greatest spirits that I've met. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to have a long-standing partnership with Barry Altschul who I think we've been playing for a decade now, and every time we play, he brings the energy of a small city to it, and uh, and he has such an open philosophy about how, no matter whose gig it is, uh, every person on the bandstand has a chance to be a leader. When, when they're feeling that muse, he wants that person to, to take over. So I've just been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with these great musical minds and great musical spirits and great philosophers of what music can be, where music can go, and not just be dogmatic about styles or anything like that. So um, I just, I've loved getting a chance to play with these creative musicians and I hope to keep meeting more and keep playing with them some more too. Great. Actually, one of the parameters of music is a humorous, humorous side music. Yeah. How would you describe your sense of humor? Is it provocative? Wow. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I think... If you're trying to be honest with yourself and your own music, you want to bring out aspects of who you are individually. And for a long time, I tried to shy away from this or that emotion because, you know, that's not what academic school musicians or school jazz musicians or improvisers do. But the older I get, um, I've come to embrace different aspects about my own personality and humor is definitely one of those aspects and a lot of my humor is the contrarian or it's provocative and uh i feel like for me it's a welcome thing when i find other musicians who share that kind of thing and evo today in the today's sessions made me laugh in the middle of the takes because he definitely shares some of that humor and what if attitude and uh provocativeness if that's a word by the way, is there any aspect of today's session that uh, made you reflect on the approach of playing the saxophone in the 21st century? Do you believe that the saxophone has been explored already in its potentiality, technically speaking, harmonically, uh, rhythmically, probably jazz, and correct me if I'm wrong, has covered it all? But from the technical point of view, do you think 
this and the next generation of saxophone players, including yourself and Ivo Perelman, could cover and unlock some unexplored windows of opportunity from the saxophone on the technical side. We know that Perelman is obsessed in the altissimo register, which is sometimes misunderstood by the by the mainstream as noise or uncontrolled, freakish, shrilling, yelling sounds. But as a saxophone player, you know that there's a lot to be controlled and explored musically there. Do you think that you guys cover today some areas in that realm? So it's a couple of questions. Yeah. Man, the saxophone has a long lineage of solo recordings and people pushing the envelope. I feel like there's always somewhere to go. It's really up to practitioners' imaginations and their willingness to put in the time to not just follow what this long respected lineage of saxophone history is. You know, um, at first when we started playing, I was just appreciative of Eva's openness to different sounds, to being open with no parameters whatsoever, because that's already a big step. And then for someone to be so precise in the altissimo register or, you know, with just a mouthpiece, which happened today, um, it just goes to show that like, okay, these ideas are out there. And as long as my generation, the next generation, the, the generations coming in 10, 20 years, there's plenty of room for, for new technicalities to happen. And it's just a matter of people putting their foot down and, and, and going for what they actually hear in their head, as opposed to being careerist or trying to just make uh, one million followers on Instagram or make a million dollars or whatever the trappings of fame might be. Great, great answer, thanks. Okay, uh, an interesting question here. Uh, from, um, uh, you have played so many different styles of music. One assumes you have listened to and enjoy a wide range of music. Now, getting gigs require that you learn to play different kinds of music. Uh, was it hard for you to adjust to all those different styles you 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 played and you had to work with, sometimes in the same day, different styles, jumping from gig to gig. Yeah, I mean, so growing up in Chicago, it's it was just a melting pot of all different styles. And I found myself playing different gigs within the same day where they called for different styles all at once. And at first, I was trying to compartmentalize a lot of different things and trying to make sure that I put on this hat, I put on this hat, put on these pants for these gigs. But the older I get and the more clo the closer I get to the music that I want to make uh, for all my music, it's just I'm trying to be myself no matter what the styles are. The style has become less and less important. I try to bring my own brand of humor or personality or time feel or sonic explorations or whatever to whatever situations come up. But I've definitely been in a situation where I was playing completely free music and my love for Coleman Hawkins jumped out of the saxophone and I started playing in a Coleman Hawkins vein. And for me, that kind of thing is super interesting, that that melding of different styles, because we live in the post iPod generation. We live in a generation where these younger students and these younger musicians they've grown up with being able to toggle any sort of style within one second of each other at the touch of a button so i think the music moving forward will reflect that in some way shape or form and i think that's just the way things are things are developing so uh it's definitely not something forced it just came naturally for me but I think it's something that I want to pursue because I see music moving that way in the future. Very cool. Three quick questions, that's it. Uh, you've played on and off with free jazz legend Barry Alchu. How did this collaboration form, and what have you learned from playing with Barry? Yeah, Barry has been one of my biggest musical inf influences since I discovered Conference of the Birds, uh, the Dave Holland record, back in, uh, in undergrad college. And when I moved to New York in 2001, I made it a point to try to track him down. And it took me a few years, but I found him. And we did a gig at the Old Stone, John Zorn's club. 
And it was like we'd been playing together for forever because I used to practice along to records he was on and just focus on his drumming. So when we started playing live, it was it was like I'd played with him for years. I was doing a Sonny Rollins tribute project back then. This is in 2011, where we would pick a standard and play it for the whole set. Um, and whatever happened, happened. But we would just stick to one tune and it could do whatever it wanted. So I was using different drummers at the time. And, and after I had met Barry, I was like, hey, do you want to do this Sonny Rollins tribute project that I'm doing? And when he played it, I knew that he was the perfect drummer for it. Because the entire history of the music is within his sphere. He could play time with the best of them. He knows the repertoire. He knows also he knows a thousand tunes and the lyrics and the melodies, and he's played free jazz with 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 the best of them. So, so the whole my whole Rollins tribute project was trying to incorporate the entire lineage of the music, and so he was the perfect guy for that. The record that we did for that band called Foxy, I couldn't be prouder of. It's one of my. I'm so happy with that record. I'm so happy with Barry's playing on it. And from then, uh, I uh, put together a trio with him and I and Mark Elias, and we have a touring trio that's made a couple records. And I'm on his, and I'm, I'm in his group, Barry Altschul's Freedom Factor, and we've put out four records. And he's just, you know, affected me greatly. His philosophy, his openness, his ideas, how you don't want to repeat zones within a set or a night, so you want to give all. You're 100% in whatever zone you're in, and when it moves on, don't try to repeat that zone. His ideas of everyone being a band leader at any given time on the bandstand, that's permeated through my own music. That's that's helped my compositional sense, and that's helped who I am as a side person in any number of bands that I've been in. You were the winner of the Thelonious Monk saxophone competition in 2008. Are there any anecdotes you would like to share from that experience. <laughs> yeah, so I won the Thelonious Monk competition way back in 2008. And when I joined, when I joined the competition, or competition, I just wanted to meet Wayne Shorter. <laughs> that was like the, the thing that I wanted to do. He's been a hero of mine, his openness, his philosophy behind music. And so to get to meet him and Herbie and some other great musicians, Jimmy Heath and Greg Osby, um, that was a dream come true, come true. And the, and quote unquote winning it or whatever that could have, if it happened two hours later or earlier or a day earlier or later, that could have changed super easy. But the, the biggest lessons I got out of it were getting to hang with Wayne and see how open he wanted the music to be and how communicative he wants the music to be and how community based he wants the music to be. And so when I saw him the next year, he he pointed at me from across the room and he came up to me and he was like, you have to go your own way. And he turned 45 degrees and marched out the door. And, you know, from that experience, I was like, you know what? I really have to follow whatever muse uh, or whatever direction music wants me to go in. And so the idea of being fully open to whatever directions and not being stuck in in styles or genres or, or chasing some kind of money thing or something. I really owe that to to Wayne and the Monk competition, which, which is a hilarious uh, outcome for winning that competition. <laughs> cool. Um, you cite the AACM as a model aspiration for the work you create. Can you speak on teachings or experiences you've had with specific AACM members and what wisdom you have gained through those experiences? Yeah, I've been lucky enough to hang out with Roscoe Mitchell a bunch of times. And, you know, as one of the, the AACM figures, one of the figures for solo saxophone playing, and one of the, you know, composers in this this genre that joins bold and contemporary improvisation and finding a way to, to compose in that way and meld improvisation and composition in that way. It's just been invaluable to get to hang out with Roscoe these times. We, we trade emails. When I see him at festivals, we get to hang out. He's just uh, an inspiration to the nth degree. And, uh, you know, I've traded emails and traded CDs with Douglas Ewart. I've run into Braxton a couple times. So just 
just these spirits of these people being on the planet and seeing how their openness has, you know, transformed into this as, as they've gotten older and gained more stature, how it's become its own thing. Um, it's very inspirational to know that if you just follow along your own musical path and don't deviate from it at all, something's going to come out of it. And Roscoe has been a huge inspiration in that regard. Okay. Last question. Yes. You have it in your lap, a very rare instrument called the slide saxophone. Yes. How did you, that's my question. <laughs> how, how did you come about playing this odd quote unquote instrument? And how do you think it be, it, it contributed to today's project, to today's recording with Perelman? Wow. Okay. So this is a slide saxophone from the late 1920s. Um, I'm sure it was a novelty instrument at the time. There were all these American uh, music companies that were making saxophones. You know, Kahn was making the mezzo-soprano saxophone and the Kano sax. There's a thing called the goofus, which is, it's a sax, it looks like a saxophone, but it's like a harmonica type deal. And there were several companies making these slide saxophones. It's impossible to play. You can't really play biop heads or anything on it, but it does provide like a theremin type wavy like sliding into notes thing that other saxophones aren't doing as easily so when evo was like okay you know this project is based on having all evo playing duets with all the different uh types of saxophones i recommend i brought up the fact that i have one of these instruments and i'm so glad that he was open to bringing a slide saxophone to these duo sessions because um it just brings a different energy uh i was playing sopranino saxophone for the rest of the session and that really is in a in a zone the soprano brings you in a certain timbre and it brings you in a certain location and being able to break that up with the slide saxophone being able to like incorporate some humor from the slide saxophone but also trying to get different timbres and be as serious as possible with it um it just kind of widened the palette and i think both evo and i were appreciative of it being here for a little bit <laughs>